Few worse things can happen to a video game than the passage of time. Yesterday's hotness can quickly become today's trash as technology and game design as a whole quickly progress. There's plenty of games that suffer this cruel fate, but to me, few games have it more rough than Donkey Kong 64. When DK64 released during the holidays in 1999, the world was about to enter the new millennium. We were in an age of making everything bigger all the time. Things don't have value if they aren't big. Games needed to be over 30 hours long, have half a dozen playable characters, and to just drip with an excess of content in every way imaginable. These naturally stem from the trends of the time as quite a bit of the industry has and always will. And whether or not these things are seen as a detriment or not is subjective, but for Donkey Kong 64, they absolutely are. In many ways, Nintendo pioneered the direction that 3D platformers would take for years to come with the release of Mario 64 in 1996. Players ran around levels completing tasks and collected coins and stars to progress through the game. The good folks at Rare took this concept and nearly perfected it with Banjo-Kazooie in 1998. Banjo added even more collectibles than Mario 64, yet it was all smartly woven together with some expert design in both the world and gameplay. By this point, the term collectathon had been coined, meaning any 3D platformer where the goal was more about exploring worlds and finding everything in them, rather than just beating multiple levels in succession like many 2D platformers. You don't need to get everything in a game to beat it, just a certain amount of said collectibles to finish the game. The trouble for Donkey Kong 64 is that it adds significantly more collectibles than Banjo-Kazooie ever did, to the point where the game feels bloated. In DK64, there's five playable Kongs, Diddy, Tiny, Lanky, Chunky, and of course, Donkey Kong himself. The first four of said characters are unlocked as the game progresses, meaning certain areas are cut off from the player early in the game. Instead of stars or jiggies, players collect golden bananas. Each Kong has five golden bananas in every stage, meaning all seven stages and the overworld have 25 different golden bananas to collect. Every Kong has their own set of unique moves and attributes that make them different from one another on top of having their own specific color-coded regular bananas, which you'll need to collect to feed a giant hippo so his pig friend can unlock the boss door, which you need to unlock the boss doors to get the boss keys so you can free your new pal Clumsy and eventually beat the game! <sighs> so with all this information in mind, you can probably tell how huge Donkey Kong 64 is, but the issue with it is the tedium and how you change characters. See, these different bananas and items can only be picked up by certain Kongs, depending on the color. This means that should you wander somewhere with DK and find red bananas, you'll need to backtrack to a character tag barrel, select Diddy, go back over, pick up the bananas, find some purple bananas, find another barrel, and just repeat this process of backtracking over and over again. This right here is why people can't stand DK64, myself included. The playtime is stretched to an immense length, solely because you can't change characters on the fly. This also means that you need to commit to memory where certain items are located so you can come back later, which probably sounds simple, but every level in DK64 is huge. At times, they can become confusing and it's not hard to lose your way when you're desperately trying to find a tag barrel. Fortunately, there's a solution, but it does have some caveats. Behold, the DK64 Tag Anywhere Hack. Created by Isotage, this hack utilizes the normally unused D-pad on the Nintendo 64 controller to swap through every character on the fly. DK64 also reacts accordingly, meaning those pesky multicolored bananas will become visible when the right Kong pops up. There's also plenty of puzzles in DK64 that require you to swap between the Kongs to keep them going, be it a different instrument, weapon, or move. Without the tag hack, these are a slog, and many of the early puzzles can't be completed until you have a different move or character, meaning you'll have to leave the stage entirely and just remember when to go back. 
With every Kong unlocked from the start, but not their moves, weapons, or instruments, you're able to complete almost every stage from beginning to end before needing to leave, with very rare instances that you'll need to return. In fact, I only found two instances where I would need to revisit levels I'd already mostly cleared out. And that was only to 100% said stage, which I would absolutely not recommend anyone doing. That's the thing. Tag Anywhere is, in my opinion, the best way to experience Donkey Kong 64. It shaves off the backtracking and allows you to really enjoy the exploration aspect. Anything that you can't access all but guarantees that you need to find the next power-up from Cranky or one of the other friendly faces located in the game, all of whom do appear in the levels that they're needed. As a result, the game feels much more in line with Banjo-Kazooie, wasting less time and usually keeping things interesting. But with all that said, it doesn't completely fix Donkey Kong 64. Although you don't need every golden banana to complete it, DK64 does require that you have at least half of them, and many of these objectives wind up repeating in the form of minigames with varying results. Even with the backtracking largely eliminated, many stages feel a bit too big for their own good, especially when sections repeat and look almost identical to one another. And finally, and this one's admittedly pretty subjective, there's a lot of noise in this game. Every character, especially the five playable ones, all yell, squeak, grunt, and just constantly make sounds in every little thing that they do. While you might not personally find it irritating, do keep it in mind if you're going to be playing this in the same room as someone else. There's also those caveats we mentioned earlier to keep in mind when using the Tag Anywhere hack. The biggest is how to actually play it. As of this video, Tag Anywhere is intended to only be used on actual Nintendo 64 hardware via flashcards. Emulators aren't recommended, and most of them seem to have severe issues, except for Moopin 64 Plus. Moopin is the only emulator I could get DK64 running on properly, and that's where all this footage comes from. Anything in terms of setup or further information on how to run this hack, you'll need to use Google since this video is probably skating on thin ice as it is. The other thing to keep in mind is saving. I tried as hard as I could to get Moopin to save the game properly, but it never wanted to take, regardless of my settings or what I was playing it on. Again, the developer of the hack doesn't recommend emulators, so do note that if you play it this way, you'll need to use save states to maintain your progress. That might all sound like a bit of a hassle, but if you enjoy 3D platformers, especially collectathons, you owe it to yourself to give Donkey Kong 64 a try with this hack. It isn't perfect, but Rare's talent and love of their games from this era is on full display here. Even though some areas can repeat and get confusing, it doesn't change the fact that DK64 is a very pretty game for the Nintendo 64, pushing the hardware to its absolute limit and beyond what it's actually capable. The soundtrack is also phenomenal, as you'd expect with Grant Kirkhope nailing the vibe of every level and creating tunes that'll get stuck in your head for days. And frankly, when it's all said and done, there's a lot of fun platforming in here too, arguably more than any other game in the genre. On its own, Donkey Kong 64 may be a slog to play through, but with a little modern magic, DK64 is well worth your time.